This is BBC News. The latest headlines. The adult film star Stormy Daniels is giving evidence in Donald Trump's hush money trial. The United Nations urges Israel to reopen two key crossings into Gaza as talks are underway in Cairo to agree a ceasefire. Prince Harry is in London, but it's been confirmed he won't be seeing his father, King Charles, this time. The Eurovision Song Contest kicks off in earnest tonight, not too long to go. It's in Malmo. Who are the favourites to go through to the grand final? We'll have all the very latest for you. Now to Scotland, where John Swinney has been chosen as the f new First Minister after becoming the new SNP leader. His predecessor, Hamza Youssef, formally tendered his resignation to the King today after announcing he'd be standing down last week. With more, here's our Scotland editor, James Cook. John Swinney is no stranger to this walk. He's been heading into Holyrood since the day it opened. Today, though, was different. It was the changing of the guard. And I call on Hamza Youssef. My heart will forever belong to Scotland. So to have the opportunity to defy the far right, to defy the racists, to defy the bigots who told me to go home, but be in a position to serve my home and to have had the opportunity to lead my home, well, that has been the most tremendous honour that I didn't think was reserved for people who looked like me. MSPs then voted in a new SNP First Minister, who said he agonised over whether to stand because of his concern for his wife in the pink jacket, who has multiple sclerosis. I cannot let this moment pass without making clear to Elizabeth my profound eternal gratitude for the sacrifices she is prepared to make to enable her husband to serve our country as First Minister. As for policy, he named one priority. So I will be unapologetic about bringing to this parliament the measures we can take to eradicate child poverty. And I look forward to seeking the support of others to achieve that aim. Words underlined with deeds as Mr Swinney crossed the floor to shake the hands of the opposition leaders. So, John Swinney insists he wants to get back to the founding principles of this parliament, to the politics of consensus. But that leaves a couple of questions. One, is his pledge credible? And two, what do the opposition parties make of it? We'll continue with that constructive agenda on a progressive vision of Scotland's future and an ambitious approach to tackling the climate and nature emergency. What remains to be seen is whether John Swinney will be receptive. Is John Swinney personally a man you can do business with? As I'm a grown-up, and ultimately that means putting differences aside, and I will work with anyone. So yes, I can work with John Swinney, but we have to be clear that it's only on those areas of cooperation, the priorities for the people of Scotland, nothing to do with the Constitution. That has to be off the table. But for now, a moment of pride as the new so First funny, Minister heads funny. into the official residence before being sworn in tomorrow. James Cook, BBC News, Edinburgh. Now, there's been a new twist in a peculiar case that's gripped Australia. A woman suspected of poisoning people with deadly mushrooms has pleaded not guilty to murder. Erin Patterson faces three counts of murder for allegedly dishing up a poisonous beef wellington dish that killed her parents-in-law, Gail and Don Patterson, as well as Gail's sister, Heather Wilkinson. Well, Ms Patterson has always maintained her innocence. The lunch actually took place at her home in Leongatha, a two-hour drive southeast of Melbourne back in July last year. Police say the group was served death cap mushrooms, which are highly lethal. Well, Ms Patterson was named as a suspect after she and her two children appeared unharmed after the lunch. It's also alleged that she tried to kill her estranged husband on three other occasions. Well, Ms Patterson has repeatedly said she didn't intentionally poison her guests. Her case, though, will now be fast-tracked to Supreme Court in Melbourne for trial, with her first hearing scheduled for the end of May. More details now on the case. Here's our Australia correspondent, Katie Watson. Erin Patterson has always maintained her innocence, but this was the first time that her legal team said she would be pleading not guilty to all charges against her. Now, the charges relate to a lunch that she put on at her home in Leon Gaffer, which is a town a few hours' drive from here in Melbourne. At that lunch, she served a beef wellington with mushrooms, and attending that lunch 
were her in-laws as well as her mother-in-law's sister and her husband too. Now, after that lunch, all of the guests fell ill and three of them subsequently died. Uh, the fourth guest in Wilkinson, he was in a coma before recovering, but the police said that it was alleged that she fed them the death cap mushrooms. Now, also invited to that lunch was her former husband, uh, Simon Patterson. He did not attend. Now, the charges against her are three counts of murder and five counts of attempted murder, and they also include previous alleged attempts against uh, Simon Patterson's life. Now, also decided at the hearing was that the case will be fast-tracked to the Supreme Court. That means that a trial will come sooner rather than later, and the next hearing is expected in this court here in a few weeks' time. Now, in the UK, a woman motorist who says she's been left traumatised after being falsely ordered to stop on a motorway by a male driver posing as a police officer has been told there'll be no criminal investigation and that police have decided not to speak to the man face to face. She says she didn't stop because she feared it was a repeat of the Wayne Cousins case. Cousins used his police warrant card to falsely arrest Sarah Everard and then kidnapped and murdered her. Our Home Affairs correspondent June Kelly reports. Motorways bring safety issues for lone women drivers. This woman was on her own on the M1 in Leicestershire. She admits she was speeding. She wants to remain anonymous and is using the pseudonym Lisa. We've used AI to disguise her voice. She told us how she suddenly became aware of a male driver also on his own. He suddenly swerved in front of me. He wound his window down and was now waving a black wallet frantically up and down with a very visible police badge out of the driver's side window. And I thought, oh no, he's a policeman. I'm speeding, I should pull over. So I just pulled into the middle lane here and he slowed back and pulled alongside me. With her car stationary, Lisa described what happened next. He leaned over, holding the steering wheel's one hand here and was waving it out of the passenger side window. And he was driving alongside me all the time, waving this thing, telling me to pull over. He was really angry and I felt really stressed. I immediately thought of Wayne Cousins and David Carrick. When she didn't stop, the male driver eventually slowed down and pulled off the motorway. Lisa noted his registration. When she reported him to the police, Lisa was told that the man was an officer with the Northamptonshire force. Northamptonshire established that he wasn't one of their officers, but he had had a civilian role with them. And then when I find out he wasn't a police officer, I actually felt even more frightened and scared. So because now it was an alleged crime of impersonating a police officer, Northamptonshire passed it to the Leicestershire force. This is because Lisa was driving in Leicestershire's patch. Leicestershire admit they were then slow to investigate and didn't speak to the man. There's a six month time limit on bringing prosecutions in cases like this and the deadline was missed. Months later, and only because of Lisa's perseverance, the Northamptonshire force finally spoke to the man on the phone. Apparently the first and only time he's been contacted by the police. He denied any involvement. I, I still actually feel really sick, really panicky, really shaky and really scared. I would say he was a fake policeman who wanted to do me harm or danger. It's obviously still affecting you badly. It is actually, yeah. I, um, I'm surprised actually how upset I still am. Northamptonshire police say only Leicestershire could have carried out a criminal investigation. Both forces have apologised to Lisa for their failings. June Kelly, BBC News, Leicestershire. Now, in just under a month, voters across the EU will elect members of the European Parliament. But well, the poll will determine who leads the EU at a crucial time amidst wars on its doorstep and a cost-of-living crisis. We've been reporting from different countries across Europe, looking at the issues at play in this election. After France and Spain, we're turning our attention to Italy. Our correspondent, Mark Lowen, went to Latina, just south of Rome, to look at what's concerning the voters there. The big beasts of Italian politics are lining up for their European battle. 
and at Circe Farm, south of Rome, which rears 1,800 buffaloes, the question is whether change is afloat. It's a very Italian family business, churning out exceptional mozzarella and ricotta. Here the, the, average, uh... the grandson of the founder says the problems are many, from European farmers being undercut by non-EU countries to another long-standing Italian issue. It's not that easy to find workers. Medium salary in Italy is not growing up from a long time. And this is very sad because many times uh, young uh, university students prefer to not work instead of, uh, uh, of working just because of, of this. It means they employ migrant workers to fill the gap. And there's no shortage there, with new arrivals soaring by 50% last year, despite the government promising to crack down. So at the Centre for Young Unaccompanied Migrants, more keep coming, and the town is feeling the strain. It's OK for now, the numbers that we are receiving now. But I don't know in the future if they, will, if they could increase more, if it would be OK. It would be a little difficult. You're at your maximum point, do you think? Maybe, yes, I think so. They put together pieces of broken lives in a country they'll now call home. Inusa paid smugglers 2,000 euros to get here from Burkina Faso. Lots of Africans think Europe is a paradise, but it's not true. Now I tell people back home to stay there, but I know they will keep trying. And even if Italy wants to stop the boats, it's impossible. So the to-do list is long for Giorgia Meloni, elected prime minister 18 months ago and still leading the polls. The main city here, Latina, mirrors Italy with the same issues and the first woman in charge. The Meloni government is working well. We have problems of a falling birth rate, for example, which affects all of Europe. We used to passively accept migrants, but now we have a big say in managing flows. It's important that our party wins this election so we can put forward our ideas at a European level. Behind Italy's blustery beauty lie its age-old problems. But what has changed here in the past 18 months is who's trying to solve them, with Giorgia Maloney dominating Italian politics and hoping to further entrench her position after these European elections. But well beyond these shores, Europe's other right-wing leaders are also looking at her as a sort of figurehead an example of what they too will hope to achieve. And so a key moment for Italy and for Europe, a vote on how to navigate these rough times. Mark Lowen, BBC News in Latina. Still to come on The World Today. Prince Harry is in London and it's confirmed he won't be seeing his father, King Charles, during the visit. And the Eurovision Song Contest kicks off in earnest tonight in Malmo in Sweden. We ask who the favourites are to go through to the grand final around the world and across the UK. You're watching The World Today on BBC News. Sin duda, mi objeto favorito para fotografiar es el sol. Me gustan otras cosas, pero le, le dedico todo mi esfuerzo al sol porque cambia a diario, incluso con diferencia de horas, puede haber cosas que aparecen y desaparecen como una erupción solar. Realmente es algo muy dinámico. Estar pudiendo ver o fotografiar un poco la, la vida íntima de, de una estrella es realmente muy, muy emocionante. Eso a mí me resultó muy interesante al momento de capturarlo porque eso es un filamento, eh, que es, eso es plasma que está flotando sobre la cromósfera del Sol y me llamó mucho la atención porque es como que dibuja un signo de interrogación. Era como que el sol es tan misterioso que incluso dibujó un signo de interrogación sobre su superficie para, bueno, de cierta forma recordarnos que hay muchas cosas que todavía no sabemos de él. Original Global Stories from the BBC. Now it's been revealed that Prince Harry will not meet the king during his visit to the UK this week. A spokesman for the Duke of Sussex said a meeting between father and son wasn't possible because of the king's busy schedule. Well, Harry is in London to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Invictus Games, which, of course, he helped set up uh, to rehabilitate wounded or sick service personnel. Well, I spoke to our royal correspondent, Sean Coughlin, and asked him how surprising this was. 
Well, the last time Prince Harry came to Britain was in February, and that was shortly after the announcement of uh, King Charles's cancer diagnosis. And we know that King Charles is still receiving treatment for cancer, which is still ongoing, and we know also that he's begun to uh, go back to public engagements. And so there had been plenty of speculation that when uh, Prince Harry had come all this way and uh, we knew he was coming, they, they might possibly meet, but it seems not. And so I suspect there will be more speculation about the family dynamics surrounding that. Uh, and it's not just King Charles he won't be meeting, it'll be other senior members of the royal family. So I think, as you, as you, as you suggest, this might be slightly surprising that he won't meet any of his family. Now, let's take you to Eurovision. Tonight's semi-final will open the much-anticipated concert in Malmö in Sweden. 15 of the 37 countries will perform tonight. Only 10 of them are going through to the grand final on Saturday. Amongst the most anticipated performances this evening are Bambi Sag for Ireland, Baby Lasagna for Croatia and Windows 95 Guy for Finland. Well, they're going to be joined by the top 10 from Thursday's semi-final, as well as the big five countries. I'll go through those in a moment, which automatically qualify. And, of course, last year's win. Sweden. Well, David Silito reports now from Malmo. Hello, my name is Windows 95. The man in the egg is representing Finland. Here, the Netherlands and Europapa. Eurovision has arrived in Malmo. Security is a bit more visible than normal because of issues surrounding Gaza and Israel's participation in the contest. But tonight, all attention is on the first semi final. And for one country with a long and illustrious Eurovision history, something a bit different. Hi, my name is Bambi Thug. So how would you describe your style? Ouija pop. Non-binary, uh, alt, witch, boss. And the reaction in Ireland, would it be fair to say mixed? Yeah, definitely. Definitely a mixed reaction some priests not liking me very much and I don't think you're too bothered by that are you um no it's been quite a journey for Ireland going from the days of double Eurovision winner Johnny Logan What's another to Bambi Thug's goth witch melodrama there'll also be UK interest tonight with a chance to see Ollie Alexander's performance Songs matter, but so too does staging and spectacle. An idea that Ireland is definitely embracing. David Solito, BBC News, Malmo. Well, I'm joined by Scott Bryan, a TV critic and broadcaster and a big Eurovision fan. We're not there, though, now, are we? We aren't. No, not we, yet. Hopefully, hopefully soon. I'm going in a couple of days, actually, to Eurovision, which will be super exciting. The most super exciting thing, though, about this year is the fact that it's just such an open contest. We're just talking, weren't we, mm. about the fact that we just don't know who the winner's going to be this year. No, I mean, that's a really interesting thing, because last year it was very much between Finland with Carrier. Um, he did the cha-cha-cha routine and, of course, the eventual winner, Lorene from Sweden with Tattoo. You know, very two different music styles. And I think what that has caused with this year, with a lot of the entrants coming in, is them to maybe go back to the drawing board and, and, and try to stand out in different ways. And I think that's why you're seeing a real variety of artists um, being put in, not the normal conventional um, conventional quote-unquote Eurovision-y song, but I don't think that really cuts it anymore. So it means that it's quite exciting because you don't really know how it's going to go on the night itself. So t tonight's the first semi-final, 10 acts go through, the UK get an automatic pass uh, because we pay a lot towards the actual running of Eurovision. As do Germany, Italy, Spain and France. France, yes, yep. yeah, yeah. You have been prepping well, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> later, I'm so excited later about this week. on Thursday. Yeah. So who are the big favourites? So the big favourites is Croatia so far. I mean, baby lasagna. It's rock, pyrotechnics, a lot of buzz around this. I think they've really been able to build up quite a big social media following as the competition it has, it has been coming together. Um, also, Ireland, Bambi Fug. I mean, there, I mean, there's Eurovision odds, lots of betting odds, and that will change as the week goes on. But they've really been rising up the charts. There's been rehearsals so far each week when that has a packed audience. They have a very unique sound as well, don't they? Very unique sound, and I think it's really distinctive. I mean, of course, Ireland um, has done it. It's the most popular in terms of overall wins in Eurovision history. But it's been a while. But it's been a while. It didn't <laughs> qualify last year to the final, and I think that's caused a bit of... Um, a, a 
attention on, on the hope that they will be able to um, this time. And also Finland. I mean, last year they had Carrier. I mean, this year it's Windows 95 man. Um, it, it's a thing he that I can... He does have an egg, doesn't he? Yeah. What's the egg thing? starts by climbing out of an egg. Then it is a homage, a parody of the Windows 95 launch. That's the one where a lot of executives were sort of dancing on stage. Um, bizarrely, they can't show the Windows logo, so they're blurring the Windows logo. So right. it's one of those performances where you sort of wonder, will it be that entertaining factor that will resonate with millions yeah, of viewers, I, or will it go over I people's I love heads? the Pyrotechnics. It reminds me a bit of the Carrier song from last year. And finally, I think we're running out of time, aren't we, Leila? Um, let's just talk very briefly about security. We have to cover it. Security mm. is really strong, isn't it, this year? It is. I mean, there, there's been, I mean, they, they say they've really upped security. They've also brought in um, a lot of reinforcements from nearby countries in including Denmark. I mean, of course, there are protests. Reportedly, more than 20,000 people are going to be attending those protests um, in regards to Israel's inclusion in the contest. Now, Eurovision has always said that it is non-political. It's merely a friendly uh, competition between different uh, public service broadcasters. I think other people will say that it's not acceptable in regards to the ongoing war for Israel to be included. Eden Golan, who is the Israeli performer, is set to be um, performing on Thursday. It's going to be interesting to see how this plays out, whether there will be protests during the, the actual telecast or whether um, it will continue without a hitch. I think it's going to be something that you're going to be keeping an eye on, and so will I, as, as the week goes on. We've got about 20 seconds. Oli Alexander, the UK entry. Are we going to go no point or are we going to do really well? I love the song. Uh, yeah, I mean, I love the song. I mean, I think what's really interesting is the staging. I mean, it mixes in a gym... A f um, like a spacecraft in space with male dancers around. I think the Daily Mail is going to have certainly be in a bit of a flap about it. We'll wait and see. Tourism in Antarctica is...